All right, I call the Des Moines City Council meeting for March 10th to order. And with that, I'll have Council Member Steinmetz lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic to which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Member Steinmetz. Let the record reflect that all seven members are present. And with that, Bonnie, do we have any correspondence? Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, there are no correspondence, uh, but we do have the following have provided written public comment. Joan Bailey, very disappointed. Bob Bergenheyer, support Tad and Vic. Pam Harper, Animal Control, Des Moines, Washington. Nancy Kennedy, I support the appointment of Yoshiko Grace Matsui to the open council seat. Yoshiko Grace Matsui, thank you for your consideration. Sandra Mock, the council seat appointment. And Colleen Wojciechowski, catalytic converter theft. And Mayor Ted Doviak has signed up to speak tonight and he has been admitted to the meeting. All right, thank you. Um, if, before we take public comment, I would just like to remind participants that any any person making personal, impertinent, or slanderous remarks or who become boisterous, threatening, or abu personally abusive while addressing the council will be removed from the meeting. When, when it is your time to speak, you may turn your camera on. And if, if, you, if you have one, after you have concluded, please turn your camera off and you will have three minutes to speak. With that being said, Tad, you have the floor for the next three minutes. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to say thank you to uh, all the council for the work they do for the city. Um, today, I managed to uh, find an election that uh, I won. Um, I was just uh, elected slash appointed as president of the Des Moines Police Foundation, where I've served for the past few years, um, following in uh, Janelle Stoneback's uh, footsteps. And I just wanted to inform the the city council of that and thank them for their support of the foundation over the years. Um, we do have some events coming up that we'll be promoting um, uh, to support the uh, police department. And uh, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up on that so you can uh, watch your emails and uh, hopefully attend some of these events as we move forward. That's all I have for today. I just wanna say thank you for your support. Thank you, Ted. Be sure to get us those calendar dates uh, so we can be present at very, uh, very awesome events that uh, serve great causes. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our city manager, Michael Mathias, for his report. Thank you, Mayor. We haven't had a city manager's report for a while, so we've got quite a few items, but in addition to congratulating Tad, I also want to acknowledge that Bonnie Wilkins does a tremendous amount of work for the Police Foundation. So I um, want to also thank Bonnie for that. So let me start <clears throat> with uh, emergency management. I want to bring City Council and our community up to speed several events associated with the pandemic. First, it appears based on the data that the impact of the pandemic is on the decline. This has prompted several actions by the governor's office, King County Public Health, King County Emergency Operations Center, and ourselves. The first of these is that, is that as of March 12th, this Saturday, masks will no longer be required in city hall facilities. This is consistent with directives from the governor and King County. However, we are not reopening city facilities at this time until we have further confirmation that the trend of decline of the pandemic is strongly established. We have started the process of opening some of our park services and programs and facilities for recreational use. This is also the case with some smaller events at the senior center. One issue that came up in the current legislative session in Olympia were some efforts to constrain the governor's emergency management proclamation um, dynamic. These efforts failed as the bill died on the floor of the House. The effectiveness of our emergency proclamation and our efforts to address COVID can be seen in the outcome 
that has resulted in no fatalities and no serious hospitalizations for any of our city staff. Emergency management to which we have devoted significant resources and which Shannon has done a wonderful job of implementing in cooperation with other first responders, the fire district, our partners in the private and public sector and the King County Emergency Operations Center have, cre have created this outcome. We have submitted a draft comprehensive emergency management plan required of us by the state for state review. It is a reminder that city council also has duties under emergency management and a number of our council members have not completed the appropriate ICS NIMS training. These are required courses and we will be following up with you again to encourage you to be current. Um, other than that, I just want to, to, to bring you up to date. We have used any uh, powers associated with the emergency management proclamation sparingly. Essentially, they were utilized in the beginning when we closed city hall and city facilities and went on um, very vigilant watch regarding COVID. I wanna bring you up to date on another issue. Um, recently, Dan Brewer and I had the second of our con ongoing conversations with Selena Taylor, the mother of Ezra, who was shot at La Familia in that uh, violent evening. And we uh, talked with Selena and her family about the possibility of the city helping do something to memorialize Ezra. Um, so we're gonna continue those discussions and at some point bring to council what our recommendation would be for support for that family and some way of helping because their concern and it's really beautiful to hear and to see is for the well-being of our community and how do we help bring the community together in remembrance of Ezra. So that was another thing I wanted to let you know. Um, we're gonna have two presentations in a minute. One of them a construction update and Andrew's gonna provide that with, with Denise. Um, also that construction update is a direct result of an inquiry by council member Nutting who wanted to be up to date on what's going on in the city given uh, you know, the, the council kind of getting back in stride after the, the, the change that we've experienced. And just relative to that presentation, I just wanna make one comment. Um, the question came up regarding the name of Soundview Park. Soundview Park was included in the Park Senior Services Master Plan that was approved by the council. Typically a park can be named after a donor, for example, Mary Gay, when park space is donated to the city. That was not the case with Soundview since we paid market value for the property. The city has been very engaged in maintaining the cultural resources associated with Soundview, which date back to the times indigenous people were the only inhabitants of Puget Sound. Since the question has been raised, when the property was under contract for $2 million to a private developer to build condos, it's unlikely any historical recognitions would have been included either Native American or more recent history. And I just wanna reiterate a point that the mayor made at the time we acquired Soundview. And it was not only were we doing something positive for the community, we were preventing any negative from occurring that would have blocked views and restricted access to that property. And if you have an opportunity, you should see the changes that are going on down there. They're really spectacular. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Andrew Murgis and Denise Lathrop to provide a brief construction update, what's going on in the city. All right, thank you, City Manager Mathias and good evening, Mayor and City Council. This is Andrew Murgis, the Public Works Director. And Denise Lathrop and I, thank you for your interest in current construction activity within the city and would like to provide a brief overview of a few priorities that you and the public can actually see being built today. Next slide, please. The biggest project we've got going on is the North Marina Bulkhead and Restroom Replacement Project. And I just wanna take a big deep breath right here and say that our pile driving activities and noise and shaking are complete. So 
big milestone for the project. Uh, now it's actually getting 90% of everything else done and completed on this one. So, but you know, all the, all the hammering and all of that is done. So as everybody knows, we're replacing the restroom and the bulkhead itself. Uh, we're completed to date. Pile driving has been completed. The tie back anchors, which are hard to see, but in the, in the bottom little tiny picture where those bright uh, green type pieces of plastic are, there's a piece of metal bar in there. And that's the tie back anchors. And we've also completed all the revetment installation or all of the big rocks that go on the water side of the bulkhead to prevent scour and erosion. Uh, right now in a lot of these pictures, we've got one photo here of the pile of driving. The other two photos are our next really big task on forming and pouring the uh, concrete caps for the bulkhead as well as the break water. So that's going very, very smoothly right now. The contractor and the city uh, city's team are scheduled. They're looking at a September 2022 completion of the project, which is phenomenal. It's about a year ahead of schedule. Uh, based on our in-water federal permitted work is complete as well. So uh, big shout out to the entire project team on, on being where we're at today on that project. Next slide, please. Next one is the Soundview Park, another great project with a lot of action going on. Uh, so far with the renovation, we've uh, completed all the building demolition. We've built a few retaining walls, some concrete uh, stairs to the deck, some ADA ramps out there. We are currently under some extensive deck framing. So if you have a chance, drive by and take a look at it. It's actually really impressive and kind of change, changes the whole context of uh, what you see out there. So I'm really excited for when we finish that. We're prepping for concrete work for all the walkways, as well as the kind of the frontage improvements adjacent to Fifth Avenue. And we're also working diligently on the implementation of tribal art from a cultural resources perspective. The contractor right now is scheduled to probably complete the project in May of 22 uh, of this year. And some of the artwork, artwork will probably trail into the summer here as artists uh, prepare their work. Next slide, please. The downtown alleyway utility undergrounding project, that one is complete. We're kind of in closeout right now. There are a few utility poles still remaining out there with uh, Lumen, uh, franchise utility, or as known as CenturyLink. And they're working diligently to get those removed and underground or coordinate with the property owners on some remaining communication lines. But another great project, all the paving is complete and it makes a world of difference for that alleyway out there. Next slide, please. Now the next three projects, uh, I take a lot of pride in. A lot of them are interlocal agreements with our franchise utilities. Uh, the first one here is our Eighth Avenue South Water Main Replacement Project with Highline or with Water District 54. And as they replace their AC water main line, we were able to pave the entire roadway from 227 to 223rd. And in this case, as everybody knows, it was a pretty beat up road, so it was a roadway rehab project. And it was a partnership between the utility and the city to get this project completed. And the outcome today is uh, phenomenal. It's a beautiful road out there with a couple of speed humps in there, which, which are, act, which are uh, pretty effective on that roadway. Next slide, please. The next interlocal is with Lake Haven Water and Sewer District down in the lower Woodmont neighborhoods. They're replacing about 3,000 feet of AC water main. And we've got about uh, five roads we're going to be repaving in cooperation with the utility as well. So some great new roads that need some rehab down there. We also placed a new guardrail on 8th Avenue South. So if everybody knows if you've driven down there around, around the corner into the neighborhood, it's a pretty narrow road. So we put a new guardrail in. And one of the highlights is we were able to work with the contractor and provide a little bit additional gravel shoulder in front of that guardrail to help pedestrians uh, not necessarily have to walk uh, down the middle of the road out there. So that, that'll be a nice little improvement and that work should be completed. All the paving should be completed this spring as well. Next project or next slide, please. The third interlocal we have is with Highland Water District, which has been ongoing for a couple of years now. A lot of water main replacement up in North Hill and uh, another great success on partnering with the utility on getting roadways repaved and rehabilitated. 
And right now we've got about two thirds of the asphalt completed up in the North Hill on these projects with about a third remaining when we get a good weather window coming up this spring. And I know the district's excited to conclude it. So I'm hoping this happens uh, in the May timeframe. Another highlight on this project was while we were rebuilding some of the roads, the stormwater utility had a couple of needs that we identified and included in the project uh, for economy of scale. So just great partnerships all around and, and huge successes out there. Next slide, please. And in this project, while we're not under construction, I think it's very important. I know the public has made many inquiries to me on the status of this project, the uh, Redondo Fishing Pier and the restroom replacement. Right now, the project team is working diligently. We're about 60% design uh, on the fishing pier itself with about 90% design on the restroom. We're at a point where we submitted all the federal environmental permits. And the one thing I'd like to note is similar to the North Bulkhead project, we do have a lot of challenges with the Corps of Engineers and the National Marines Fisheries Service. And with that, I'm expecting, I'm hoping this isn't true and we can accelerate it, but I think most likely the construction of the fishing pier will happen in the fall slash winter of 2023. One of the big highlights on the project uh, recently is we have that Washington State appropriation uh, that helps support the project at the $900,000 level for the pier construction. Next slide, please. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Denise Lathrop. Thank you, Andrew, and good evening, Mayor and Council. It's exciting to see the progress on the Des Moines Theater. This project restores the original theater and commercial space and adds 18 residential units. The project is expected to be completed by late fall, provided there are no supply chain delays, which have happened so far in the past. Um, seven, the next slide, please. 7227, which is formerly the old Clates Tavern site, is located at the corner of 7th Avenue South and South 227th Street. This project includes 10 apartments and around 2,000 square feet of commercial space. It has a really nice entry plaza that opens onto the corner, and it too is expected to be completed uh, by the end of the year. Next slide, please. Point by Vintage is located in the Pacific Ridge neighborhood. It will provide a nice mix of housing, residential amenities, and commercial space that fronts on to Pacific Highway South. This development adds activity to the neighborhood and will help remedy crime in the neighborhood as it was uh, developed utilizing crime prevention through environmental design principles. This too is expected to be completed by the end of the year. Together, these three projects will add 189 units of new housing to the city. Uh, next slide, please. The Burger King and Popeye's restaurants you may have seen are under construction at the northeast corner of Pacific Highway South and South 220th Street. This is adjacent to the Waterview Crossing. Construction is moving along quickly and the developer expects to be completed this summer. So Andrew, I'll turn that back over to you. All right, next slide, please. All right, thank you, Denise. Uh, last slide here. There are a couple also big strategic priorities for the city, which will be covered in future council meetings, committee meetings, and the goal setting uh, meetings coming up. Those would include the marina dock replacement, uh, ferry service discussions, as well as the entire marina redevelopment project. And with that, Michael, that concludes my presentation or our presentation. Thank you, um, Andrew and Denise. Council, I just wanna make the point that first of all, that's a lot for a city of our size to be happening all at the same time. Secondly, it's happening in the context of COVID, which was restrictive relative to face-to-face -face access. You, you can never convince me that people working at home don't get 
the same amount or more done because they do. A lot of this was done through telecommuting. A lot of it was done through um, virtual um, dynamic. We had um, Denise, the planning, community development, our building department, our engineering department, transportation, everybody involved and everybody coordinating to get these outcomes. And I think the time horizons that Andrew identified and Denise identified are just extraordinary in terms of the amount acti of activity, the success of, acti of that activity, and ultimately the completion of that. So if you have any questions, we'll be happy to take them, but um, it, it's just, you're seeing your staff at their best. Council Member Nutting has a question. Uh, I, I, I've got a couple questions and I just like to, uh, um, they're technical. So if I could get them over to Michael and he can pass them on to Andrew, um, there's no need to, it, it's getting into the weeds just for my information. I'd like to know some, some stuff about like the tiebacks and a few other things. The slideshow was incredible. Thank you guys very much for putting that together. Um, phenomenal information and um thank you staff for all the hard work um and then thirdly uh is it going is the can can council get the slide deck emailed to them and will it be available on the website so if we get questions from constituents about what's going on we could just email them a link to the slide deck absolutely I will email you all a link to the packet as well as the um, presentations from tonight, tomorrow. Awesome, thank, thank you so very much. It was incredible. Thank you, Council Member Nettie. I'm moving on to Council Member Harris. Uh, thank you, Mayor. A uh, Couple of things, sorry to jump around. Um, so uh, the, at the theater, these are going to be apartments, not condominiums, correct? Correct. Um, is the uh, seven uh, building, is that market rate housing or some? That's my market. understanding, yes. Yeah. Okay, and um, is, uh, and last is the, um, the restaurants, the Burger King and the Popeyes, is it um, <clears throat> far enough along where uh, you can see uh, ingress and egress? I guess I'm, you know, thinking about the drive through and, you know, traffic impacts. Those were all reviewed um, during the design review for the project. So we looked at all of the ingress and egress as part of that review, transportation reviewed. No, I, 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 I'm sure. I'm just asking if there's like a, like a, you know, a picture or something that basically, you know, just, uh, makes it clear how that's going to work yes we can we can provide you a copy with that if you want to take a look at it but yes we have that information i, I would very much if you could do that thank you so much thank you council member harris moving on to deputy mayor buxton and i see you council member Oxiger, as well uh i echo my colleagues what a great uh, presentation and so exciting to see over and over to hear that's going to be done by the end of the summer that that's going to be done by the end of the year this is fabulous work I'm so impressed and it's exciting like council member nutting asked to be able to respond to questions and send people this this is a fabulous presentation I had a question in regard to the restaurants going in across the street point, point by vintage is a, I can't remember if there's a crosswalk there or if there's a yeah. something council, council member uh deputy mayor those are not across associated point by vintage oh, those okay. are just south on the east side of, of uh, pack highway just south of waterland crossing okay there was a big open area there there was like about an acre that was available and it's sort of kid a long kitty corner to midway park Okay, Council Member Oxiger. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and thank you uh, to the staff for the uh, update. It was very informative. Uh, I too think it would be beneficial if we had it posted on the website uh, for the public to see. Um, <clears throat> I do have a, a question. 
is there some point in the future that we can get an update on the uh, progress and timeline for Wesley's uh, redevelopment? Uh, that and also there's a, a new building that's going up uh, just south of the J.C. Marble uh, company there opposite uh, Fred Meyer. And I was wondering if we could report on what that is. So, yeah. Um, so, Council Member, we will provide on the 31st an update to both of those questions. And we will get this out on the website. Thank you. Council Member Steinmetz. I have to unmute first. Uh, I'd just like to echo that with excellent presentation. Um, and love to see it all up on the website if we can get that out where everybody can get it. On the uh, project on 7th Street, uh, do, we, do we know if there are uh, any occupants that have signed on the bottom for the retail space there yet? And if so, what, what are they? And, and, or is there a target plan for what kind of um, businesses they want to try to get in there? Um, I don't have that information at this time, but we could reach out to the developer and find out if they've signed any leases for that space. But it's general commercial space. So, you know, typically what will happen is somebody will come in with tenant improvement to utilize that space. So it could be a restaurant, it could be a small retail shop. Councilmember Steinmet, you, you raise a really, really good question. And that is ultimately we'd like to see retail that activates the street. Across the street, you have a bank, not a lot of traffic unless you're going to the bank. So, but that's something that we can hope for, but I don't think we can actually require as long as it's commercial. But certainly we can um, find out more about what they have in mind. It, but your point in general for the city is very well taken. Thank you. Um, City Clerk just reminded me that uh, all of these, all of these, all of these uh, presentations are part of the packet on the website as well, so they'll be there. Uh, I, I just, I got a few, my questions answered, but what it's exciting to see is progress. The city's sat for a long time, and and I know a lot of hard work's been done over, especially since you become the city manager, Michael, and we're starting to see the process progress. I mean, it was a uh, it, the, we had to till the soil, we had to plant the seeds, and now we're seeing the success, and it's exciting, and this is where this is where the change comes, and I'm excited to see it. So thank you for the presentation as well, and I'll let you move on to the Des Moines Marine Enterprise. Right, so thank you all for your comments. Um, now we'd like to move on to a discussion um, about the marina, which I think grew out of the more recent um, update we provided to council about dock replacements. And Dan has prepared uh, with help of other staff, um, a presentation on the financing of the marina, some, I would say some references that have gained some currency among the public that are not exactly accurate. And we thought this was a good opportunity to try and address those. So Dan, with that, I'll turn it over to you. All right, uh, good evening, mayor and council. Um, as Michael said, uh, this is kind of part two of a uh, presentation uh, relative to the marina, um, kind of a follow along um, to our February 10th meeting where we updated you on the status of the dock replacements. Um, and um, we've made good progress since then, uh, moving forward with, uh, with our design efforts. We're at about 45% design on LM and N dock. Um, and our goal is to get um, to uh, permitting, enter that permitting uh, process as soon as possible. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, there are some significant challenges ahead uh, for, um, for us as well on the marina dock replacement. So we wanna get started in on that as, as soon as possible. So 
I've made good progress on that. And but tonight I wanted to focus on um, some misconceptions that we've heard out in the community and just address um, address some of those in a in a presentation format. As always, this presentation will be posted on the city's website as well as the marina website. Uh, we have all of our presentations posted there um, over the last couple of years. And uh, so anybody that's interested could look at um, this presentation later. Uh, next slide, please. So the purpose of this, again, is to just to clarify the status of the marina enterprise. Uh, we want to explain the management strategies and requirements of the marina um, as an enterprise. We want to uh, spend a few minutes to address a number of misconceptions about the marina and specifically about the use of marina funds. And we're going to do that by preventing presenting uh, some facts and data uh, to speak to these issues. Next slide, please. So some of the misconceptions about the marina you know, out in the community, here are some of the things that we have heard people say. We've heard people say things like the city took money from the marina at the expense of replacing docks. Now replacement is more expensive and those who pay more and fuel will be stuck with the costs. We've heard things like the city, if the city hadn't robbed the marina, they would have had, we would have had enough resources to cover the cost of the bulkhead replacement. We've heard the city has taken money from the marina for years. We've also heard things like that the services that the city provides the marina have been inflated in order to take more money from the marina to support the city. We've heard questions like, shouldn't the lease, leasehold tax excise payments paid for by the marina, shouldn't that be credited against the indirect cost allocations of the marina? And shouldn't Des Moines residents get a discount for mortgage rates? So those are some of the things I wanna to try to address tonight in this presentation. Next slide, please. The first thing we have to point out is that the Des Moines Marina is an enterprise. That means it's, a, it's managed like a separate business, uh, just like a private sector business would be run. The city accounts for all fi uh, marina financial transactions in a separate and transparent fund and we call this the Marina Enterprise Fund. The city has 10 full-time FTEs, full-time dedicated staff that we dedicate specifically to the Marina Enterprise. So our Harbor Master, Assistant Harbor Master, office staff, and our operation and maintenance staff, uh, we have 10 FTEs, and those are the direct operating expenses of the Marina. But the marina also relies upon other city staff to provide various uh, administrative functions of the marina. And I use that term loosely, and I'm going to explain what I mean by that in a minute. But essentially, it, it's uh, financial, legal, human resource, information technology resources um, that the city provides for the marina. These are indirect operating expenses of the marina. And we account for those in an indirect cost allocation. Sometimes in the past, we've you may have heard us refer to this as an interfund transfer, but really it's it's an indirect cost allocation of these uh, support services that the city provides to various departments. Next slide, please. So I want to explain that a little bit more. What is an indirect cost allocation? In the city, we have a number of what we refer to as uh, support service departments, our finance department, human resources, information technology, our legal department, city administration, um, and even the city council. These support service, the support service functions of these administrative departments are paid for by the city's operating departments. And we do this for greater efficiency with shared resources. So as we think about what the operating departments are, I mean, they're on the right side of the screen here, our police department, the court, community development, parks, recreation, senior services, public works, our capital improvement program, 
our surface water management utility and the marina. Um, it would be terribly inefficient for each of those operating departments to have all of each, to have each of them have all of these different support service functions. So what we do is we share the costs of those administrative support service departments. Next slide, please. So those, the costs of those support service departments are shared proportionally amongst the city's operating departments based upon a number of factors, including but not limited to the overall size of the department. The bigger the department, the more of the burden of those indirect costs that the department carries. So that can be based on budget or in the, act, the actual uh, expenditures and revenues. We look at the number of employees that the department has. We look at the types and uh, the am amount of various assets, whether it's vehicles, computers, buildings, docks, et cetera. We also look at the amount of risk that a various operating department carries. The more risk, um, the more um, attributed, the more of, of those administrative services that are attributed to the department. And we also look at the number of transactions and contracts that occur within each of those departments. So those are some of the factors that we look at as we calculate a proportionate share of the support service departments to the operating departments. Next slide, please. So what is the history of the marina's indirect cost allocation? So uh, we've just taken a look at the last 20 years. Obviously the marina has been around for 50 years. Uh, I'm not going back beyond uh, the, these 20 years for tonight, uh, but you can look over the course of the last 20 years, what the indirect cost allocation has been for the marina. On average, it's been just over 475,000 a year. We've had some years where it's, uh, uh, the high was just under 690,000 in a year and the low uh, just over 200,000. So it varies uh, from year to year based on a number of factors. One of the things you'll notice in this slide, and we're gonna to speak to this in future uh, slides coming up is there's a remarkable decrease that's occurring in that 2013, 2014 timeframe. And a large part of this is attributed to uh, Michael's efforts when he came on board to really look at the functional operation of the marina. And from the marina's inception, um, everything that's down on the waterfront down there has been part of the marina operations. Everything in Redondo had been part of the marina operations. And, and so we're gonna talk later on about uh, the waterfront zone and the Redondo zone where um, a significant liability was removed from mar the marina operations. And that's what you're seeing um, a, a big part of this decrease um, in the indirect cost allocation. Um, one of the things that's shown on this slide is, I mean, obviously we're seeing year over year what the, the administrative uh, or the indirect cost allocation is, but one thing that this slide doesn't answer is, is this reasonable? Is what's shown here year over year for the indirect cost allocation a reasonable proportion based on what the marina has been uh, providing? So let's look at the next slide. What we've tried to do here is to show um, the marina's indirect cost allocation as a function of the marina's gross operating revenue and the direct operating expenses of the marina. And so I'm gonna be clear up front that this doesn't include capital improvements or debt service uh, functions of the marina, but just the day-to-day -day operational uh, costs of the marina. And what you can see, um, typically you would expect to see um, the operating revenue and, and operating expenses to be somewhat um, uniform. And, that, and we see that here, um, but you see them gradually declining um, since uh, two, the 2001 um, 
through uh, 2021. Um, we see on this graphic here, this orange dashed line at 15%. And um, one of the things that we look at when we think about administrative services is what is reasonable as a function of what the uh, business provides. And 15% is pretty typical. I've seen it as high as 30% um, in some of our engineering consultant firms on federal federally approved contracts. Um, I've seen it as low as 10%, but 15% is a pretty typical number for administrative services that you would see um, of, of a line of business. So it doesn't necessarily say that that's right or wrong. It's just a, uh, a point of reference for you to consider as you look at um, the, the marina's indirect cost allocation over time. So from around 2006 through 2013, you can see that the marina's indirect cost allocation was hovering right around that 15% line. And, and since the reduction in the, uh, the creation of the waterfront zone and redondo zones, which I'll touch on later in the presentation, you can see that that's also declining um, um, beyond 2013. Prior to 2006, you can see that there were a few years where the indirect cost allocations was above that 15%. But as I mentioned, you know, uh, I've seen other lines of business where indirect cost allocations or administrative service functions of the business have been anywhere from 20 to 30%. So uh, here, this is just trying to give you a point of reference um, as a function of these revenues and expenditures. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so this slide uh, is to show you um, that indirect cost allocation is shown in orange across the bottom. And again, we're comparing that to the gross operating revenue, the green bar and our direct operating expenses, the blue, the blue bar. So you can see as a proportion of what those uh, expenditures and revenues are, just how small in proportion to everything else going on in the marina that indirect cost allocation is. Um, and again, this, these numbers exclude our capital um, improvement projects and debt service functions. Next slide, please. Okay, I wanna now address this question that we've heard relative to leasehold tax payments. And the question has come up, shouldn't the, shouldn't the marina get a credit for the leasehold tax payments uh, that are paid? Before I answer that question though, I think it's helpful to describe and answer, you know, what is leasehold excise tax? Um, Leasehold excise tax is a tax paid by persons or businesses who use or lease publicly owned property. Real estate and property owned by a government entity is not subject to property tax. So when private parties, individuals use government property, they're provided the same governmental services as all other taxpayers. And a good example of this is public safety. Um, down at the marina. I'm gonna come back and touch on that in a minute. The leasehold excise tax um, uh, compensates governments for those services. The state's leasehold excise tax rate currently is 12.84% and marina tenants pay leasehold excise tax for the use of marina facilities. Next slide, please. So in 2021, the marina excise tax, the leasehold excise tax collectively was just under $400,000. So how, how is that distributed? A point that I wanna make clear is all of that leasehold excise tax leaves the city. The city writes a check to the state of Washington and all of the leasehold excise tax goes to the state. And the state then 
reallocates that leasehold excise tax in the proportions that I've shown here. They keep about 53% of that, 16% goes to King County, and 31% approximately comes back to the city. So last year, of that 400,000, the city actually received uh, about 124,000 in leasehold excise tax from the use of the marina. We have other sources of leasehold tax around the city, but this is specific to the marina. Next slide, please. So back to the question, shouldn't, shouldn't there be a credit of the leasehold excise tax against the marina's indirect cost allocation? So in 2021, the marina's direct indirect cost allocation was 310,000. The leasehold excise tax revenue was 124,000 rounding up. Shouldn't that 124,000 be credited against that 310,000? Isn't the city double dipping? Next slide, please. The answer is no, it, there shouldn't be a credit for this. And I wanna remind you of the slide a few, few moments ago when, when private parties use government property, they're provided with the same government services as all other taxpayers. So the leasehold tax revenue that the city receives from the state, the 124,000, that's used for general funded activities that support the marina. For example, public safety. Public safety makes up about 50% of the city's general fund budget. Marina tenants benefit from the city's public safety services. Uh, if you're familiar with the marina at all over the last decade, you can quickly come think uh, of several incidents where we've had police and fire uh, services required at the marina. Public safety is an operating department. It's an operating function of the city. So the costs of that operating de department are not included in the indirect cost allocation to begin with. So the, uh, uh, the credit wouldn't apply. The, the leasehold excise tax pays for things like public safety and other governmental services. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk for a minute about the, the marina's overall financial condition. And this, you know, the information we're providing is based on annual budgets and actuals. Uh, we've been looking at marina operations, primarily um, the expenditures, it direct and indirect, and, and revenues. Um, but I wanna point out too, that the city uh, and the marina also have um, expenses relative to capital improvements and debt service responsibilities for those capital improvement projects. And we pay for those things with the use of net operating revenue. So in other words, after we've paid for our operating expenses of the marina, the direct and indirect expenses, hopefully there's money left over to do capital improvements. And, and most of the time that's the case. Uh, we also, um, do capital improvements and pay for debt service with interest income. Uh, we get we have bond proceeds and, and grants from time to time as well. Next slide, please. So here's a slide that shows uh, just a history of, of the marina fund balance. Um, uh, use that term loosely. Our finance folks would call this net position, um, but most of us are familiar with kind of fund balance terminology, but you can see over the course of, of uh, the last 20 years, the marina funds are restricted and unrestricted. Um, so you'll see between 2001 and 2002, a pretty significant jump. Uh, and again, in 2008 and 2009, and th in each of those years, those are, um, years where we uh, issued bonds. And so we had bond proceeds coming into the marina to pay for capital work. And you'll see this on the next slide. So remember here in 2008, 2009, this huge spike in, in uh, uh, marina funds. Next slide, please. And so you can see here in 2009, 2010, these are uh, use of marina funds for capital and debt service. So you see that exp revenue coming in 2008, 2009, expended in 2009, 2010. And, 
And uh, that was our, our seawall construction. Um, so you can see over the course of time, here's our debt service responsibilities and the capital work over the um, expenditures over the last 20 years. Next slide, please. Okay, on, on this slide, this is specifically showing the unrestricted fund balance at the marina. So you can see that this fluctuates a little bit, rises and, and falls, um, uh, and we'll use that unrestricted fund balance to build things at the marina, do our capital investment. So 2008, 2009, you see a little drop. Um, so we were building our seawall. So we used some of our unrestricted fund balance then. And you can see we're um, since 2014, you see that growth in uh, marina revenue and unrestricted funds at the marina. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that I want to point out is when you kind of take a look at the averages from 2004, and I, I do want to point out, I forgot on the last slide, uh, um, this data we had available um, didn't go all the way back to 2001, like on the previous slide. So um, we just had data back to 2004 on this slide. I'm uh, sorry about that. Uh, anyway, as you look at the average in that first section, it's about 503,000. Um, and then after 2013, you see the average spiking at around 1.8 million. So there's a about a $1.3 million delta there. And that really shows the the impact of creating the waterfront zone and the redondo zone and, and removing those liabilities from the marina operations. Um, and so that was something that one, one of the early things that Michael focused on at the marina, and that, that has made a huge difference. And we're going to talk more about that later on, but uh, next slide, please. Finally, I want to speak to the audit history of the marina enterprise. The Marina Enterprise is audited every year by the state of Washington auditor. There's never been an audit finding that the indirect cost allocations have been inappropriate. There's never been an audit finding that the city inappropriately allocated funds from the Marina. The fact is it never happened. Next slide, please. So far, we've been looking at expenditures primarily of the marina, but there's more to the financial story of the marina enterprise. There's always two components to evaluating financial health. In almost all cases, revenues are predicated upon macroeconomic trends. They'll fluctuate up and down based on what's going on in the economy. But generally, expenditures tend to be stable through those economic fluctuations. And they're subject to things like inflationary costs that we're seeing right now, cost of living increases and other economic factors. But I wanted, we need to take a look at what's going on on the revenue side of the marina. Next slide, please. This slide council is uh, a duplicate of one of the slides that was presented uh, back on February 10th. It's a slide that was prepared for us by BST and Associates, our financial consultant. Um, as part of that presentation, uh, we, we talked about this green line, which is our kind of the current Des Moines uh, mortgage rates. Um, and we had two different slides of this, one for open and covered mortgage, but, but both showed that our current mortgage rates are 12% below the average in the Puget Sound. And we're in the mid 20% below the 90th percentile for rates in the Puget Sound. Next slide, please. As part of the financial report, this is available on the Marina's website um, that BST prepared. This is for open slips. And you can see on the on the table on the right hand side the average and the 90 upper 90 percentile. Um, this is showing that on average we're 12 percent below the market. But when you look at the slip size, you can see that it ranges anywhere from plus three percent to um, minus 21 percent. 
below the market uh, based on the slip size. Next slide, please. And this is the table that was provided for covered borage. And you can see the same thing. And there's a you know, tremendous fluctuation based on the size of the slip, anywhere from plus 1% to minus 23% below the average of the market. Quite frankly, that's appalling. Um, next slide, please. So what we've tried to do is to show you on this slide the, the actual mortgage revenue that we received over the last 20 years, and that's the green line. And if we had been at the average of the market over the last 20 years, the blue line, if we just factor that up by 12%, that would show you what the revenues should have been or could have been at the marina. So when we add up the area between those two lines, it would show us the revenue loss. And next slide, please. You see that here. So on average, we've been 12% below the market. Um, in 2021, the mortgage rates have been closer to the average of the market at any time in the last 20 years. So when we show this lost revenue potential at $5.4 million, it is at least that. The fact of the matter is the city has subsidized marina mortgage rates for decades. Next slide, please. What are we doing to address this issue? Current city policy is to set marina mortgage rates at the average market rates. We're gradually increasing mortgage rates to close that gap. As our new docs come online, mortgage rates will be set at or above the 90th percentile in the market. While at the same time, targeting an overall occupancy rate in the mid 90th percentile. We've explained this uh, before, we wanna be able to set the rates at the marina um, and, and have an occupancy rate that's just below 100%. If your occupancy rate is at 100%, you're probably not charging enough. Next slide, please. Let's talk about the marina fuel sales. The fact of the matter is, this is what the Des Moines Marina is known for in the Puget Sound. Prior city policy was to sell fuel below market to attract boaters to the city. It was thought of as an economic development tool for the Marina District. Whether or not that actually panned out or not, I'm not gonna comment, but the reality is on average, our fuel prices have remained below the market. And some conversations recently with, with people as far south as Olympia and even up in Seattle, and these are direct quotes. We had the lowest fuel prices in the lower Puget Sound. Over the last 20 years, the marina has sold millions of gallons of fuel. In just the last two years, we sold just under a million gallons of fuel. Now, we've been slowly increasing fuel costs as I'll talk um, fuel prices, as I'll mention on the next slide, but uh, we have been well below 25% 25 cents per gallon in the market. But just as an example, if you were 25 cents per gallon below the market, and you, that means you're losing about a quarter of a million dollars for every million gallons of fuel sold. So over the last 20 years, that would equate to about two and a half million dollars. Now, in fairness, if we had fuel rates set at the market, perhaps we wouldn't sell as much fuel. The reality is we've been subsidizing marine fuel sales for decades, but at what cost? Um, at the same time, you know, there's an indirect uh, cost of having to service those fuel sales. So every time somebody comes here to, to buy a thousand gallons of fuel, we end up having to take somebody away from providing some other function of, of operation and maintenance at the marina to service that fuel sale. Um, and so there's a lot of other indirect costs associated with selling fuel like this. Next slide, please. 
what are we doing to address this issue? Current city policy is to sell fuel at market rates. So we're gradually increasing our fuel prices to close that gap. And on the left here, you see uh, a slide that we've been tracking fuel prices over the last several years. And you can see that you can see the increase um, in fuel prices. On the upper, upper right um, graph, we wanted to show um, council the, uh, what's going on in the fuel sales right now. It's really unprecedented. Um, just over the last 10 days, you can see that unleaded, this is wholesale fuel prices. Um, the unleaded prices increased by 75 cents per gallon and diesel by $1.60 a gallon. So this requires uh, almost daily uh, attention by our marina staff to change the fuel prices um, at the marina. So he, here's a little chart we put together uh, earlier in the week. And so it's really outdated now, uh, unfortunately, but um, you can see the prices on March 8th um, at Des Moines Marina, and you can see some of the other marinas um, around. And we've kind of tried to average that, you know, um, do we need to be competitive with Elliott Bay? Eh, probably not, but we definitely want to be competitive with South Sound Marinas. You know, you can see on the diesel, we're, we're fairly close on unleaded, but diesel, we still have work to do. We still have a, quite a gap to close on this. We're 70 cents a gallon, 71 cents a gallon below Elliott Bay. And on the 8th, we got a phone call from somebody who was leaving Elliott Bay marina to come here just to fill up to buy a thousand gallons of diesel um and because we have the lowest prices on the puget sound so anyway we're working to address that issue moving forward um, this is another issue next slide please i want to talk about the waterfront zone and the redondo zone so prior to 2013, 2014, everything uh, that's in that gold area on both of these slides was considered part of the operational function of the marina. So everything on the fishing pier and the north lot and everything in Redondo was, um, was covered as part of the marina operations. And, and as I mentioned earlier, Michael began to take a look at that to evaluate are these are the operations in these areas actually integral to what's going on at the marina and so we we basically uh, at that time we took these areas out of the marina um, and so the next slide please so now you know these are no longer the financial responsibility of the marina so the north bulkhead project a 12 million dollar project that's a city funded project um, uh, prior to creating this waterfront zone, that 12 million would have been paid for out of the marina. Um, there's, um, and as you can, as you could see from the financial uh, information provided earlier, there's no way that the marina could have paid for that. The parking system in the marina lot, not one penny was paid for that by the marina. It was paid for out of the waterfront zone. The revenues from that are intended were intended to pay help pay for um, the bulkhead project. Now, what about marina staff working in the waterfront zone and the redondo zone? Um, we do have our marina staff uh, work in these zones. They'll pick up trash. They'll do some service other types of services in these zones, um, and when they do, they charge their time spent in these zones. They keep track of that on their timesheets, and those represent a direct cost allocation to the waterfront and redondo zones that the city then pays and reimburses the marina for. Um, so there's some efficiency that we gain by having staff that's already at these locations, our marina staff provide those services for the city. So, um, so sometimes you will see marina staff working in these zones, but the city pays for their um, their time in those zones. Next slide, please. What about discounts for Des Moines residents? 
approximately 20 to 25 percent of the marina tenants actually live in Des Moines and that fluctuates over time um, when at the time the BST report was completed uh, late last year it was around 20 21 percent and right now it's around 25 percent so as tenants come and go uh, it'll fluctuate but typically it it's always going to be somewhere in this 20 to 25 percent. So on the on the right, you can kind of see a distribution of the Des Moines residents by slip size. So um, that 25 percent represents 127 slips are leased to Des Moines residents. I think we have right around 750 slips um, at the marina. So most of them are leased by people who live outside the city. And so no property tax of the city supports marina operations, not one penny. Property tax revenues do not support marina operations. Marina operations are paid for by mortgage rates and revenue directly from the marina. Providing a discount to Des Moines residents would mean that either non-resident voters would have to pay more and because we receive federal funding as a city, that may potentially be illegal for us to do that. Even if we, even if we did that, um, you're, you're shouldering the burden of the costs on other voters. The reality is the expenditure of the marina remains the same. Some, somebody has to pay. So either other voters have to pay or the city would have to subsidize that the amount of that discount from the general fund. The only way for the city to do that is to take property tax revenue that 33,000 other people pay and dedicate that to 127 people in the city who have boats at the marina. Next slide, please. So in conclusion for tonight, we hope that this presentation addresses any misconceptions about the marina enterprise and answers the questions that have been raised. The city will continue to carefully monitor and account for all marina expenditures as we have always done. The city will continue to strive to be more competitive in marine markets. And we're moving forward with capital infrastructure investments for the future sustainability of the Des Moines Marina Enterprise. So it will be here for the next 50 years. That concludes my presentation. Let me say first, um, that was an amazing presentation. Um, I really uh, wanna commend Dan, Scott, Katie, Beth Ann, Jeff, everyone who contributed to that. Um, it took a lot of, of thought to try to break it down some very complex pieces of information that could be explainable. So I, first of all, I just want to thank you guys for an incredibly good job. And then Mayor, if there are questions, please, or comments. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to start with Councilmember Nutty. I just want to say thank you to staff for that great presentation. Thank you, Dan. Uh, what a great job explaining uh, where the funding has gone over the last couple of years. And uh, I just, I, I appreciate that. And it helps us move forward. So thank you. Moving on to Council Member Pennington. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think the, uh, that's probably the most comprehensive explanation of, of Marina and Marina operations that, that, that I've heard in in a number of years I you know I've, I've heard all of those those same concerns and complaints and and accusations and this is really the most comprehensive presentation that I, I've witnessed in in a long long time so thank you staff for doing that um, that I think you know it it, uh, it really lets us it's, it's a valuable information as, as we're moving forward with with the redevelopment and and it really gives us a a good uh, a view of, of how the connectivity is so important to downtown. You got a guy getting a, or a person getting a thousand gallons worth of fuel, and I bet you that they didn't walk up the hill to 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 go have lunch. 
and um, and so the 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 draw here and the the information that we're getting in and how the, all the dots connect between the marina and downtown and you know that, that's that's phenomenal and and the uh, i remember the conversation about the waterfront zones and about the park zones and how we reconfigured that a few years ago and this just has validated those conversations and and the uh, the questions and the unknowns at that time so thank you uh for that that's all Councilmember harris yeah, uh, th thank you, Dan. Yeah, that, that was like really, 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 really good. Um, and um, yeah, people, um, the public won't know this, but um, you know, uh, like I decided to buy a house here, property values in Ballard were equivalent to Des Moines <laughs> like uh, a couple of decades ago. And, uh, but the Des Moines Marina was way cheaper and just as beautiful as Shilshul. And the gas was like super cheap. And that's was a part of the, it's just been an ongoing thing. The Sitterleys were just always uh, upset about, uh, you know. But anyway, my question is, when you say the costs, the uh, indirect cost allocation tracks with revenue, do you have some qualitative examples as to why? Like I would have assumed that, you know, accounting costs and there were a lot of those costs would be fixed. Yeah. Um, unless, unless you think you can answer that, I think for me, I need to have that repeated. I'm not sure I understood well, the it, question. I, I was just struck by the indirect costs seem to track fairly. I mean, the argument is that the indirect cost allocation tracked with revenue over time, um, you know, yeah. going back to the slides. And I was just wondering, you know, like why? What? So could you give, could you yeah. give me an example of those costs? Yeah. Well, uh, we, the indirect cost allocation doesn't, track per se uh specifically to the marina expend operating expenditures or revenue we were showing it as a function of that so that you could see the proportionality of that against what's actually occurring at the marina the indirect cost allocation is actually a factor of all of the other operating departments at the city sharing the proportional cost of the support services of those um, support departments like finance, human resources, legal, uh, et cetera. Hey Dan, could I, could I add one thing to that is what you would typically see if you saw fluctuations in indirect cost for the marina, those would um, in almost all cases be reflected in increases of indirect cost allocations for other departments because that would just be a function of the fiscal dynamic of the city at that moment in time. Yeah. Beth Ann, is that a fair? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I just, all I said was that the indirect cost allocation at the marina, like Dan was saying, doesn't necessarily track with either expenses or revenue at the marina. Um, he showed that to show the, the relationships over the whole financial picture at the marina, but those indirect cost allocations, if they're higher at the marina, typically they would be higher in all the other um, departments that have to pay the indirect cost allocation, which would be a function of the snapshot of the finance of the city at that time. You are correct, yes, sorry. So, so you're saying <laughs> it's more coincidental than, I mean, in other words, marina revenue went up because the rest of the revenue in the city went up. And the cost allocation went up because basically the overall city uh, expenses went up. Or am I I'm missing something? I, I think say, I, I think you got it. I mean, yeah. Okay, so um, uh, I really like the uh, uh, where you provided the specific uh, cost comparisons on fuel. Um, do you happen to have that kind of thing on other? Uh, you know, revenue streams like overnight mortgage. I'm just constantly struck by how it's all over the map. Like Bell Harbor was like 51 bucks this summer. And I'm like, what's up with that? I mean, why are we higher than 
Um, so it, it, do you have any of that kind of, uh, that same kind of matrix? Yeah. Scott, go ahead. Or, well, an example of that in the presentation was, was those tables that we took from the BST financial report. Those are, those are available on the Marina's website. That's one example where we've looked at the, and tried to summarize the moorage rates from other marinas as an example. So whether um, I'm just I'm, I'm just it's like when you say an average for these things, it's just because they are so all over the map. Um, I'm just so I guess I'm asking: Is there like another marina that you sort of model that we match up with? Not model, but that that we that we seem to match up with. Um, well, you know. Uh, Council Member Harris, uh, if I may, real quickly, last year uh, we we survey all the marinas on Puget Sound for like guest mortgage and other other rates and different things, and we did raise our rates in guest mortgage last year and different things to be a little bit more competitive. But yeah, that's uh, you go to the San Juans, they have huge charges. You go to, to you know down to Olympia, it's different. So we we we've more streamlined ours to that average now. So we're we're up there in that in that mid-level for our guest mortgage at least but, but i mean just overall is there sort of a is there another marina in the area that we are most like qualitatively uh, what I, well what i would say to that is uh, when we look at what's most competitive we're going to be looking at what's closest to us so we're going to be looking at south sound marinas first trying to be most competitive uh, proximity uh, to our marina. Okay. And one of the things too about our marina that comes up all the time, it comes up in, a, in relationship to emergency management, which is another dynamic of the marina, is that we're the only marina between Seattle and Tacoma. And so it makes comparables difficult. And our setup is so unique. Um, you know, it's hard to say what, I mean, it would be nice if there was a mirror image, but there's not. Okay, well, one, one last thing, and I promise. Yeah. That. So, so um, I was struck in that, um, that is the, you know, was there ever like a proper reserve set up for this replacement? Um, you know, for now, I mean, did we set aside uh, for today back in 1970 and, you know, pay into it? And are and if not, you know, are we doing it this time around? <laughs> yeah, but I think, but, but Council Member Harris, I mean, that's kind of the point, you know, we were never charging enough to save anything. Okay, I well, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying, okay, if the answer is no, just is, are we, is the financial model such that we can set aside money for 2072 or 2080, you know, um, assuming there is a nuclear war, I didn't say that, but, um, you know, uh, that, that we can rebuild uh, without, um, you know, going through all this. It, it, that, yeah. that would be, uh, you know, Scott and Katie have been planning on that. So I appreciate that about their leadership at the Marina and, and moving forward, as we set new mortgage rates at that 90th percentile of the market, the goal would be to have um, assessments done each each year from from the marina to set money aside for the future replacements of those docks 50 years from now. So that would be the goal. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Moving on to Councilmember Steinmetz. Thank you. I kind of I, I want to echo what a lot of people said. I, you know, as many of you know, I've been sitting in council meetings for the last six years. And uh, while there was a lot of individual pieces of that that I had gleaned from going to uh, council meetings, I thought this was the most comprehensive uh, and clear breakdown of how the uh, Marine Enterprise Fund uh, really works. And, and I want to compliment everybody on that. It, it was a lot of work. Um, a couple of questions or points that I want to make is that when you were talking about the allocation um, by apportionment uh, to the marina, the, the only alternative to that kind of a, an apportionment 
uh, would be to actually try to bill the individual time. Is that correct? So every cop that comes down there and spends, you know, 12 minutes in the marina bill, bills a point uh, two uh, time in their time. And I can tell you, that's the only other alternative that I see. I know the state does that with a lot of administrative law uh, functions that I have to know a little bit about, but um, it's terrible for morale to have to try to keep track of your time like that. And, and council member, I mean, one thing to say, because you're absolutely right about that, but also, you know, we just are in the process of implementing this new financial management system. And in order to effectively allocate time per function is, is a challenge at best without adding to it what you just described, which would, I think, you know, um, make certain of our finance folks just run from the building screaming. So we don't want to do that. Uh, but that's, you're absolutely right. And, you know, we respect the time of police, so we really don't want them spending their time figuring out the allocation of stuff. We want them to just be there, deal with it, go on, you know? And so that's how that indirect allocation works relative to being able to support our PD and other things. And that's been tested by the state auditor and found that it is they're like pretty accurate. Is that correct? It's, it's never come up. And I, 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 I want to be clear about what I'm saying. PD is an operating department, so there's going to be a charge directly to the marina for their for their efforts. But there's never been an issue with the auditor. And Beth Ann, please correct any errors. I, I will I will correct that. Um, what we do is that in the in the general fund, the police department and the municipal court, and there are certain functions that are supported by property taxes. And they are actually separated out of the general fund before we do our indirect cost allocation. So we basically look at the legislative functions, the support services, HR payroll, the things that we know that, that are um, charges and provide support and administrative functions to the marina, those get allocated. Um, and then like Dan was saying, the leasehold excise tax that comes in the city's portion would go into the general fund that goes to support the police and the courts and those other functions that don't get um, allocated out to the operating departments. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. And then the one other, the one other question that I have is that when did the change come in fuel pricing from a subsidized model to the market rate model. So and I'm gonna I'm gonna take credit and responsibility for that because Scott knows every conversation we have starts with what's up with fuel prices. Because I thought, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting about Des Moines is we were the loss leader in mortgage rates and we were the loss leader in gas prices, fuel prices. So one of those has got to change. <laughs> you either use the fuel prices to increase your demand for mortgage, or you use the, the reduced mortgage rates and you subsidize that by pumping up your fuel prices, right? And, and I'll tell you anecdotally, I got a call from the, the executive director of the Port of Olympia, and he's since left, but he called me up one day and he's a friend and he started swearing at me over the phone. I said, What's up? And he goes, well, I was directed to establish fuel storage and sales for our, for the Olympia uh, Marina. And he goes, I can't do it because you guys have stolen the market at your low prices. We can't compete at that level. I thought, man, that that's a compliment backwards. <laughs> so I think that since, you know, we've had the administration, we, we've, you know, tried to force that to a market demand piece without question. Uh, that's great. Let me endorse that concept. I mean, fuel, fuel, fuel rate should be at market rate. Absolutely. Thank you Couldn't very much. Couldn't more. Moving on to Deputy Mayor Buxton. Well, thank you, Mayor. I, I echo my colleague's sentiments here. This was fabulous. And, and I do remember coming out of some uh, other interesting conversations. So I really greatly appreciate the attention to this. The, all of these questions do come up in the community. I've raised my hands and taken it down several times because my answers keep uh, coming from you know other questions. I guess 
it would be nice to have one more quick uh, summary of the Des Moines resident discount issue. Uh, so I'm gonna, I think I will ask three questions for clarity, just, just to make sure that we have this down because that comes up. Um, no, so is it true that no property tax of city supports marina operations? Yeah, we, that's, okay. that's true. Yeah, okay. That's true. And if we were, if the marina were to offer a discount, then non resident voters would have to pay more. And because we receive federal funding, that might be illegal. Is that true? Not just voters, everybody. Okay. All right. And then the, the last one is if the city, the only other way to provide that discount would be um, the city would have to subsidize it from the general fund, which would mean 33,000 other people would have to pay and dedicate that to 127 people who have close to the marina. Is that true? That's if, what Dan said, yeah. Yes. Okay, just wanted clarity on those three points. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I've seen some good presentations from the city. I think this was one of the best. Uh, I wanna, will it be also put on the marina website as well? Fantastic. And uh, I would also recommend that uh, any of the associations or yacht clubs or stuff, love them to get a copy as well. Uh, I thought it was a genius move. It, in throughout the entire presentation, one of the biggest things that gets missed is taking the North parking lot and Redondo and getting it out of the enterprise fund where it could be allocated and managed better as you did. So I thought that was a solid move that doesn't get the credit it deserves. I also, uh, something that didn't get talked about too much was the, the, the parking gates. Uh, those have not only um, provided a revenue source um, historically and will in the future, but the, the, uh, actually the added value and reduced crime and reduced attention that the police had to do it so they could be in other places is also a great value as well. So a lot of things have been done at the marina um, to uh, make this, a, this the jewel and or gem of our, our city, along with the same uh, uh, approach you've been doing with Redondo and it's starting to, as we saw earlier today with the construction update. So I want to thank you and uh, I'll turn the floor back over to you, Michael, if you have any more. Excuse me, Mayor. Councilor Oxford has his hand up. Who did? Who did? I'm sorry. Councilor oh, Oxford. I'm sorry. My apologies, Councilmember Oxiger. Your turn. Yes, thank you. And it was very uh, interesting presentation, and obviously took a lot of work. I just have one question: Is at what point did we go to market rate fuel costs? Um, we are still. We are not at market rate, as you saw in that one little chart on the lower right. We're still below the market in fuel. And so we're still uh, slowly increasing our fuel prices to close that gap. And especially over the last two weeks, um, it's been very challenging to keep up with the changing uh, fuel, uh, fuel prices. So that's added um, another dynamic to, to our fuel pricing. But that, uh, we still have work to do on on getting to the market in, in fuel prices. So we're, we'll be continuing to do that. So what would, what would prohibit us? What would the argument be for not going to market rate setting costs tomorrow? Uh, we could, we could certainly do that. I mean, is there, is there a, a, an argument or a rationale for not doing that immediately or would it, would it harm business or what, uh, I don't know, you know, council member, I mean, one of the things that, you know, the, I think the marina was, was culturally up to a certain point may still be almost like a family operation. And we had a lot of stable moorage um, residents. And I think that there's always been a concern to make changes in a gradual manner let people see what's going on versus a dramatic manner. And so that I think was the basis of trying to move to a more dynamic market-driven model than what had been done previously. Um, so 
I mean, that's basically the explanation. We chose to do it gradually and we're still working on it as Dan mentioned. So is there a timeline for when it will be achieved? Well, there's a timeline for when it will be achieved, except for you get these exogenous shocks in the economy, i.e., you know, the Ukrainian war and, uh, you know, um, constraint on the availability of fuel, which is driving prices up like crazy. So if you were to, you know, try to anticipate economic shocks, I guess you could do that. But we think a steady, in, you know, increase is the most appropriate way to go, trying to, trying to keep up with our fellow marinas. I, yeah, and I would just add to that that uh, we're very close to being at market rates at this point. So it wouldn't, it's not going to take much longer to do that. We're just slowly ramping that up. So perhaps, perhaps even before the summer, um, and certainly right now with the fuel issues that we're having, it's more and more important for us to be at at the market, just given the fuel um, issues uh, nationally. Okay, so the, is what effect do we think that, but if we go to market rate or when we go to market rate, what effect is that going to be have on the attractiveness that we've had so far? I mean, what's going to, what then would not cause people to uh, seek other, uh, other places that might be more convenient? I don't, I don't, I don't know. You got your crystal ball there, Gene, and you can tell us. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's a sure crystal ball question. Well, those are in, in setting in setting the rates and setting the rates for the marina as far as mortgage and everything else, you have to have some idea of where how it's going to affect uh, you know a, a rate increase. Right. And we get real data off the amount of demand for fuel at different prices as it goes up. Absolutely. Because Dan made a good point, which we didn't go into too much, but the idea is that when you set mortgage rates and then you start to increase them, you may not get 100% occupancy, but there is a um, sort of a sweet spot between what you're charging and what your occupancy rate is. And you may make more money with higher rates at 70% occupancy than you would at 100% with a lower rate. There's a sweet spot in there, and that's something you know that we've worked on trying to identify. And so the same would be the case with um, fuel rates. Um, if I can just chime in for a quick second, uh, Council Member Oxinger, I uh, understand your concerns there, and but we're we are striving hard to hit that hit that average and everything else. But like you say, if if we do get too high or get above that average, we're going to lose some of that business. They'll be going down Cobos Passage, the backside of Ashon Island which is a shortcut from Seattle to Tacoma or from Olympia to the San Juan Islands. Uh, that's a shortcut. That's a big savings for people. So we need to, we need to stay competitive and, and, and stay at that place. So we attract those people to come around the Island, pick up fuel before they head either North or South. So I think that's a very important strategy that we kind of have to play with and, and be real cognitive of, of. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, so, Mayor. That concludes our manager report. Yeah. Those are all the questions. Thank Council you. Council members, we're going to move on for the brevity of the meeting. Um, with, If you'll allow me, I want to move on to the next order of business. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm uh, turning it over to the city clerk for the reading of the consent agenda. Thank you, Mayor. Item one, approval of vouchers. And that concludes the consent calendar. Do I have a motion to approve? Council Member Nutting has made that motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have Council Member Pennington with the second. Is there anyone that wishes to pull that item? Seeing none, all, all those in favor of the consent agenda, agenda item of the approval of vouchers, please raise your right hand till I call you out. I see uh, Council Member Steinmetz, Council Member or Deputy Mayor Buxton, Council Member Harris, Councilmember Oxiger, Councilmember Pennington, and Councilmember Nutting, and myself. Passes consent 7 0. All right, moving on to the new business, the Soundview Park uh, budget amendments. Um, Andrew, I believe you have the floor.
All right. Thank you again, Mayor and City Council. I'll try to be brief here on the Soundview Park agenda item update. Uh, next slide, please. A little bit of background about Soundview Park. Uh, the Washington State Recreation and Conservation Office, known as RCO, helped purchase the park uh, as a priority with north of about a million dollars. This acquisition adds to public space consistent with the city's comprehensive plan, as well as ensures that development did not limit public use and views, kind of as Michael Mathias mentioned a little bit earlier this evening. Uh, for the construction, staff solicited for construction bids and council awarded the project last fall and we're definitely underway with construction right now. Next slide, please. A lot has happened in the past few months. Building demolition, retaining wall construction, deck stair construction, ADA ramps, and deck framing are just a few of the elements completed. The contractor is projecting a May completion date this year. And like I said, there'll probably be some artistic elements uh, that drag on into the summer just due to procurement of those. Next slide, please. In this construction, it's been a very challenging project which has experienced grading, electrical, irrigation, and drainage changes, just to name a few. Furthermore, to fulfill the RCO grant obligations, tribal artwork such as a sculpture, uh, there's some examples to the right here, uh, story rocks and signage will be included uh, as part of these project changes that weren't originally included in the project. Next slide, please. In order to complete the project with the site and cultural resource changes or the artwork, additional funding is needed. The agenda item recommends first a $95,000 new appropriation to the CIP project, and then second to approve a $275,000 in spending authority for construction activity to complete the job. Currently, there is $180,000 in the existing CIP project that is available to use for construction, just not, it does not have the spending authority to spend that. So with that, plus the new appropriation of $95,000, we're looking for a total spending authority of 275,000 to complete the project. Now staff has been working with our RCO partner very closely here on some of these artwork or, or mitigation and cultural resources challenges we've had. And there's some money left over from the acquisition in which there seems to be a high likelihood that RCO will help reimburse some of that work on the tune of $90,000. So if that comes to fruition and we're able to amend our grant contract, the $95,000 appropriation that's requested in motion one would be down to $5,000 of additional money for the project. Next slide, please. And I kind of left it at that. So I'd like to open it up to questions uh, that I can answer. I know I went pretty fast through that uh, and hopefully that previous slide helped out navigate the budget constraints. Council member Nutty, you're first. Yeah, um, <clears throat> Andrew, thank you very much um, for that. And I'm so very thankful that the city has been able to acquire the property. Um, which, which, uh, what are we saving, you know? And uh, I appreciate the fact that the natives are getting approved for this. So with that, I wanna make a motion. I move to direct administration to begin to bring forward a budget amendment for the Sound View Park project in the amount of $95,000 in the next available budget amendment ordinance. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, I saw Council, Council, uh, or Council Member Pennington's hand before I saw yours, Deputy Mayor, so I'll take his today. Any other any other discussion or questions? It looks like Deputy Mayor uh, Buxton had her hand up. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. So, uh, question, Andrew: How do you? I know this is hard. What do you have? A, 
Uh, how likely do you feel we are to receive that 90,000 from our CEO? Do you have a guess? I would say highly likely. I can defer that is Nicole on this evening. She's been working directly with RCO concerning that uh, contract amendment. I'm seeing if she's on here. Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, she yeah. is. Yes. Um, so, Councilmember Buxton, we are pretty certain we will uh, will get that grant funding. I've been talking with RCO, and as long as we kind of present them with the agreement that we'll be working with the tribal artists and what that'll entail, um, we'll be able to use the leftover acquisition money for this part of the project. So I can't give you a percentage, but it's pretty likely that we'll get it. Okay, thank you. So let's say we get, let's imagine that we get that and we pass these two motions. What is the unbudgeted, bottom line that we are authorizing tonight that would not be covered by grants or is not a contingency? What's the unexpected amount that we would be approving if we approved both of these motions that is not covered? You, you, and that's a great question. I'm just kind of thinking through the couple words you use like contingency, et cetera. So the Approving these two motions approves an additional $95,000 above already budgeted and approved CIP expenditures. Okay, but you, but if we got the grant, which let's pretend that we get that grant, uh, that would leave $5,000 left. Then with the 257, you mentioned that there was 187,000 contingency that's sitting there in the budget, but we just need to approve its use. If you add that, that let me see, 187, but that's two. Does that cover with the 90,000? Does that see? I guess I'm asking that 257 but is that additional to the 95. Deputy Mayor Buxton, if I might, if we get the grant, the, the total impact to the city that's unbudgeted at this point is $5,000. Okay, that's, yep. that is cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving to Council Member Harris. You're on mute, sir. You're, you're on. There yeah. we go. Oh, okay, sorry about that. So, um, Andrew, um, who did the design of the park and when was it designed? Uh, the design was completed by KPFF engineers. And unfortunately, with the changeover in my role, I don't know exactly when that was completed, but my guess would be that it was towards right when we went to bid last fall. So October timeline. Okay. I just, I saw like, you know, sketches and I think Skylab and so on that kind of looked similar. And I just wondered if, there was some, you know, initial designer before that. You know, there were some renderings that occurred when we started talking about the priorities of the park area. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was different than KPFF. And I, and I don't know off the top of my head exactly the history of that or who did those. I'd have to okay. look back. But Andrew, a couple of things about that one. There was a conceptual look at um, Overlook 2 by David Evans. Uh, conceptually. Skylab, who's working with us on the marina, um, I believe has never done a rendering of um, Soundview. And okay. then there may be some historical other ones that perhaps Susan recalls, not sure. There is one other rendering that included the park and uh, Fifth Avenue. It's kind of like a continuous park. I remember that rendering as well. Right, right. Quite, quite a few years ago. Yeah, okay. I think that was what was done by David Evans. Susan, go on. Yeah, I can jump in there. We had a rendering, an early rendering that Makers did for us. Yeah. Makers. And we ultimately, yeah, decided not to go with them for the final design. Okay, so if this does not derive from that, like there was the thing with the sort of Van Gaskin little pointy hat deal at one point, and never mind. Okay, so um, we... Who is the artist doing these story rocks? 
So the, 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 the story rock concept at this point in time, uh, Nicole's working with contacts at the tribes to find a story that will be both in English as well as a native uh, script, I guess, if you want to call it. And then the project team will be working with, we're going to identify a vendor around the area who does engravings and rock and try to work with them on what these look like. Oh, so uh, that it'll be photo, kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that, go ahead. Or go ahead. That photograph, that's, that was like an example. That wasn't it, like the thing. It, exactly. That, that example I pulled from uh, the Isquah fish hatchery had the same type of story rock implementation done by tribe. So that was an example of what I would expect to see on this as well. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other questions? I, I, I just think the value of recognizing the presence of the indigenous people is super important. And I'm glad you made it a main focus in this project. So with that, I'm gonna take a vote. All, all those in favor of motion one, raise your hand and I will call you out. Okay, uh, Council Member Steinmetz, Deputy Mayor Buxton, Council Member Pennington, Council Member Nutting, all in myself. All those opposed? Council Member Harris, Council Member Oxiger. Motion passes 5 2. Council Member Nutting. I move to authorize two. $175,000 in the project expenditures for the Soundview Park project in order to address necessary project changes in order and required cultural resources, mitigation, and contract costs. Do I have a second? I see Council Member Pennington with the second. All right. Is there any more discussion before we take this vote? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. I see Council Member Steinmetz, Deputy Mayor Buxton, Council Member Pennington, Council Member Nutting, and myself. All those opposed? I see Council Member Harris and Council Member Oxiger. Motion passes 5 2. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to introduction of items for future consideration. This, this time is for the sole purpose of proposing, proposing new business items that have not previously been before the council for discussion on a future agenda. This is not a time for questions about old business. Council members can submit questions or seek updates on previously discussed business to the city manager at any time. Does any member have new business they would like to propose? Council member Harris. You're on mute, sir. Yeah, I keep trying to hit the thing. So um, yeah, uh, uh, because of uh, Dan's most excellent uh, presentation, um, uh, I want to see if there's interest in creating a, uh, a marina advisory committee. I think this is something that sh we should seriously discuss um, be for a number of reasons. Well, first of all, because uh, the community does not get uh, a heck of a lot of input in this, and um, I'm sure that a lot of this information is, you know, surprising to uh, most of the community, but also because the, uh, frankly, the Moines Marina Association has kind of become a de facto advisory committee. Um, uh, you know, I attended a meeting last night, and they frequently have received briefings and had input into decision making. Um, and that was fine behind the fence with the docks, but um, it there, you know, the whole thing has expanded now onto the land side. And it's striking to me how much, uh, you know, the people, the condo owners um, are left out of this conversation. This is uh, serious money. It's the largest capital project in city history and uh, there needs to be a public venue where uh, anyone in the community can engage. The DMMA uh, should be seated at that table, but it should be a table that is recorded and affords public comment and that uh, is part of the city process. The DMMA is 
uh, let's uh, remember, is a private organization. Um, they decide who attends, and this is information that the entire community uh, should be involved in. So that's my proposal. Uh, can we have a discussion about a uh, Marina Advisory Committee? So, so my proposal is that you submit it with the with your items for the strategy review for the April seventh meeting. And that's a, and I think that's a wonderful notion, Mayor. But um, I'm asking if there are two people willing to uh, put it on an agenda today. And if not, well, you know, great. Point, point of order, order, Mayor. This is point of order, Mayor. Go ahead. Go ahead. This this is not a portion of the meeting where we take a vote on what we're going to put on an agenda or what we're going to do or not going yeah, to there, do. There is, if there was consensus, my belief is that it can be handled better at another meeting. We've recently appointed two people to be liaisons uh, from the council. That's council member Nutting and council member Pennington. And there is going to be a plan for public comment and feedback. So this, this may be taken care of. And I would rather have that at a strategy or at a later date, have, city, have the city manager in one of his reports update us on that process. And just, just to be clear, there are not two colleagues who is, will see the yes. wisdom. Councilmember Harris, I have this. Thank you. Um, is there, is there, oh, Councilmember Oxford, do you have a comment? Yes, I would second uh, uh, Councilmember Harris's uh, proposition. Is there a third? Seeing none, we will move on to board and committee reports. Thank you. So we're going to start with Councilmember Steinmetz. You have the floor. I don't think I haven't really been in any committee meetings, so I don't have anything to report. Thank you, sir. Councilmember Oxiger, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have no uh, committee reports either tonight, uh, but I would like to share some information. Uh, the Des Moines Pool Metropolitan Park District has secured a $79,575 uh, grant uh, through the State Superintendent of Public Instruction's office uh, to provide free swim lessons uh, for kids ages uh, 4 to 14 uh, this spring and summer. Uh, the Summer Enrichment and Experience for Kids grant will include free practice time and a free swim package with swimsuit goggles, uh, towel, and swim bag. Uh, the grant is part of an effort to help eliminate barriers to learning uh, a life-saving skill and to give kids access to water-based recreational activities. Swimming is also a healthy lifestyle that kids can enjoy from now until they become seniors. And that's not high school seniors, that's senior citizens. Uh, many of you will remember uh, Faith Callahan, the namesake of the Mount Rainier Pool Swim Scholarship Program. She lived at Wesley and was still swimming when she left us at age 105. Uh, she often attributed her longevity to her twice weekly trips to the pool. And now as the swim lessons will be free, you can imagine that there will be significant demand. Uh, and it comes at a time when there is a critical shortage of lifeguards and swim instructors across the country. Uh, the pool district has also received a $10,000 grant to recruit and provide free training and certification for uh, persons 15 and older who want to become guards and instructors. Uh, it is part of the effort to support supervised active recreational programming in our community that is so critical as we emerge from COVID-19. Uh, uh, and in conclusion, I just want to note that the mayor has told me that the council will shortly be going into an executive session uh, to discuss potential litigation against the uh, Des Moines Legacy Foundation. As a legacy board member, I have a remote interest in the topic and have therefore recusing myself from the process to protect both my integrity and that of the council. Thank you. Thank you, council member. 
Oxiger, and then moving on to Councilmember Nutty. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, had the distinct pleasure of um, attending the Des Moines Marine Association meeting last night and uh, with uh, some conversation that was brought up um, as the liaison, um, the April meeting, we will be bringing them a, a little bit more information about what's going on down there with the uh, replacements of LM and NDOC. And uh, um, look forward to being part of that process. So thank you. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Harris, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. So um, I sort of view my role as the loyal opposition here. Um, I tried to ask a uh, second question. You know, we're the only city that has, a, has this two round limit in, in the area. And, you know, the mayor wanted to move things along, which is his right. But I just want to note that uh, we have the shortest meetings in the area and we have not hit uh, two hours. So, um, you know, it just seems a little weird. And here's the deal about that is that um, the, the vacancy process um, took up, you know, essentially a quarter. So we're now clumping a ton of business into meetings. And when you compress the calendar like that, it makes it even more difficult to provide oversight. The train just keeps moving and it looks like we're getting a lot of stuff done, but that's only because a lot of stuff got clumped into one meeting. Um, I will never vote for anything having to do with Soundview Park simply because uh, the Van Gaskin house was a uh, mistake. But you know, the funny thing is, is that if this were another city, there would have been community uh, meetings to get input on the design. It's a community park and there should be meetings where we talk about what the residents want and you know, just their feedback. Uh, along those lines, um, the uh, applicant for the vacancy, Tad Doviak, he, made a good point. Um, you'll note we're working on two restrooms, Redondo and at the marina, and uh, neither of them are consistent branding. Okay, so you've got this case where we have this opportunity to make them look the same so you know you're in Des Moines, and we're not, um, and that's a shame. Um, and uh, regarding the marina, um, you could do some sort of discount voucher. Um, it's a public marina, okay? I mean, it was built for the city. Revenue optimization, sure, absolutely. I'm with you all the way, but um, if you tailor, here's the thing about it. It's an enterprise fund, so the money stays at the marina. It's not like if you start generating zillions of dollars it accrues to the rest of the city, okay? So, you know, yeah. Um, and um, finally, I had a lot of calls about the election and, you know, people yelled uh, about uh, the application process. And I'm like, you know, I didn't vote for it, but um, find more candidates. The reason there are the same people up here, there have been, I can count on the fingers of one hand, the competitive elections in this town in the last 10 years. If you want change, find people to run. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Harris. Moving on to Council Member Pennington. All right, thank you. I attended the uh, Des Moines Marina Association meeting uh, last evening with uh, uh, two of my fellow council members. Uh, it was a really good meeting. Uh, we got some some uh, good input from from the, uh, the folks there at the at the association. So uh, thank them for that. Um, and again, thank you to the staff for the the construction update and the explanation on the enterprise fund at the marina and how that works. My only question. Um, perhaps to, to our attorney is um, the the legality of di giving discounts is, is since it's an enterprise fund does it fall under the um, gift of public funds 
uh, restriction or, or is it different because it, because it's a business that the city owns? So anyway, I have that one question if, if, if you've got an answer for it. If, if you don't have one tonight, that's okay. Yeah, I don't. I'm sorry. I think we noted in the um, presentation it was potentially um, not appropriate. Um, and that was because we haven't really delved into that. There was also some um, limits because of the federal funding we've received. So it's kind of a, a complex issue that we haven't fully reviewed yet. Okay, thank you. And then the last thing uh, to Tommy Owens, uh, congratulations on being promoted to a city engineer. That's quite an accomplishment. So um, beyond that, uh, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Pennington. Moving on to Deputy Mayor Buxton. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, on Tuesday, I attended this terrific uh, business meeting, a, a gathering of businesses to have a discussion that was hosted by the police force and several of our officers, our chief, our uh, CSOs, and hosted by La Familia, the location up there. It was a, a, a gathering to just discuss the challenges that these businesses are facing on the highway. It was incredibly productive. Uh, our officers, our force heard the concerns. They're working hard to address the concerns. I think one of the things I most, was most impressed with is our chief's attitude. He just, he refuses to make excuses for uh, the challenges that they're facing, not being able to respond like maybe they have been able to in the past. And so I appreciate his attitude. It's upbeat, it's a can-do attitude. I was, I'm, impressed with the collaboration, the creativity and the personal energy of our force, not just our chief, but the officers that were there, the positive attitude. Some of the stories are kind of heartrending, but I feel inspired even to advocate and support anything that our force wants to do up there, anything that we can do to help these businesses. Um, our force is inspiring, they're undaunted very impressed with the meeting they're going to be, uh, that conversation is going to continue up and down the highway with businesses working to collaborate and, and address those challenges. Uh, also, a couple weeks ago, I attended the Soundside Alliance for Economic Development Policy meeting, and we don't talk about this collaboration often, but our city is part of a five city collaboration that also works with the Port of Seattle, Highland College, and the Soundside Chamber to inform, draw economic interest and investment into our little subregion here, and also to support our existing businesses through educational programs, through events, our web presence and advertising. And uh, it draws interest into this local region. Uh, we have a lot to offer quality of life and and location down here we still with the education recreation that we've got here compared to the price of those same kind of things in other parts of the county so i especially in this collaboration appreciate um sbdc the small business development center at the college and supporting of a, a lot of our small businesses and also the chambers work in networking and advertising. So that's all I have for this week. Thank you, Mayor. Oh, I know. Uh, we meet quarterly and I was elected chair of the South Side Alliance Policy Board. So thank you. Congratulations, Deputy Mayor Buxton. Thank you. you do a lot of work outside the city um, to benefit us and we really appreciate that. Thank you. Council, um, March 7th, was a dark day in our, our city's history. Officer Stephen J. Underwood um, was murdered and in, in the line of duty. And one of the best ways that the council has been able to honor him is take money from the Hearts and Minds Foundation and put it into a scholarship for somebody pursuing a law enforcement career in the future. I'm proposing that we move $1,000 from the Hearts and Minds Fund to that scholarship as we have annually. Council Member Nutty. Uh, if that's a motion, I second it. If you need me to make the motion, it, uh, 
I'll, oh. I'll consider mine the motion and I'll consider yours the second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Seeing that it's 7-0, we will move the money to the scholarship and I appreciate all council members supporting that. The only thing I'm gonna to add to Tracy's comments about um, the, the meeting with the businesses on crime and, and in conjunction with our police force was, it was an awesome turnout. And I got to meet a lot of business owners. I knew some of them and I hadn't met, met others. And it was very, uh, I thought it was constructive. They were, even though many of them were frustrated, they were constructive. They believed in what we were doing. Um, I thought the chief had taken some great time to explain the efforts, uh, all, the, all the resources that we were being used throughout the city. And um, we are working on other ways that, so we've, we've got a lot of takeaways and we are working on those. And um, I know that there'll be some discussion in the public safety and emergency management meeting coming up on some of those issues. So I'm looking forward to that team working on that. And with that, at this time, we go into executive session. The purpose of the executive discussion is to, do, is to discuss potential litigation under RCW 42.30.110, Paragraph one, paragraph I. The ex ex executive session is expected to last 30 minutes. At the conclusion of the executive session, no formal action will be taken by the council and we will be adjourning the meeting at that time. Our next meeting date will be March 31st, 2022 at 5 p.m. With that, we move to executive session. Thank you.